Present. Here. 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 Thank y'all so much. Dean, Jane, do you want to join us? That's okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over today, y'all. Sorry. Yeah. The um, obviously, y'all. Let's let's uh, prayers with our city manager as she um, recovers. Um, I talked with a little her med- medical leave. Yep. I spoke with her yesterday. Good she sounded a, you know, a little. She was in pain, but other than that, she's good and taking some rest that she doesn't know how to take. So she, I think she's bored laying down. But excited, to, excited to have. Jeff here is an active city manager. He has to learn words other than no. Uh, <laughs> but should should provide for short meetings, I guess, right? Uh, if nothing else. So, so I keep Teresa. saying no. We keep agreeing. It'll be real short. <laughs> so, Teresa, if you're crazy enough to be watching us right now, we miss you. Uh, and, but we're going to rock and roll. Get things done. Um, all right. Rev, Rev you want to open up a word of prayer, please? Thank you. For all that you've done for us for for this day and for all of the gracious and hopeful possibilities you are allowing us to share in. Be with us today as we gather around this table to discuss the business of this, our city. Be with our city manager as she continues to heal. Allow her to feel and to sense your presence. Lord, we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Mr. Palin. Okay. Mr. Mayor, members of council, our first item on the for the work session today is our fiscal year 2018-19 general fund department revenue proposals. And Ms. Missy Hoffman, our budget and program management director, will start the presentation and discussion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hey. So as we start to delve pretty deeper into the FY18-19 budget discussions, um, we are continuing our conversations from last year and um, going forward in terms of considerations for revenue proposals and considerations that support primarily the general fund. So what we're bringing to you today are two different department presentations. One is a proposal for a potentially a brand new rev. Um, Fee that we currently don't don't currently charge. The other is a return of some proposed adjustments to various rates for parks and recreation um, that's been discussed in the past. Some edits were made, so we're just bringing that one back forward to talk talk through those changes as well. But as we go as we're going through and we look at this sources of the general fund, one of the things we wanted to keep in mind as we're talking is. The sources of revenue that the general fund just has currently has just so we can keep some things in perspective um, especially as we look at what sources of revenue support the operations and the activities of the general fund per- currently about 38 percent of our revenues are covered by property tax another 29 percent is covered by licenses and permits um, next to that would be charges for services of about 11 percent so those would be the charges and the activities that um, and then the one that's apparently not showing up is um, would be intergovernmental services. So those are the different types of activities that fund the general fund primarily from revenue sources um, for various things. As you can tell, property taxes, 38 percent um, only th- cover, generate only about 38 percent of our revenue streams to support the general fund. And our general fund budget right now is about 140 million. Get those four thousand pieces of property that aren't paying property tax into the fold through some type of funding. Um, sure would make that look a lot better. Well, that's a perfect leadway into some of what we're bringing forward to you. That'd in be terms a segue. Segue into other um, sources of revenue streams in the sense of helping to. Um, provide for a revenue stream that helps cover the cost of the services that, it's, that, it's, that we're offering 
but also too, it is something to help us more equitably distribute the basically the tax burdens that we share um, for the services that we provide. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is streetlights, and actually, I'm going to turn this over to Robert Anderson, who's going to talk a little bit more distinctively about. Um, we've talked about this this fee before. Um, it's been a little while. Um, it's something that's come up, but Robert has some more information to provide. Thank you, Missy. Over the past several years, the Public Works Department continues to add street lights throughout the city of Columbia. We bring every one of them to council to add so that we know that we're, that, that we're adding them consistently. So right now what we've done is put together during the budget process this year a proposal. We lease about 9,400 lights from SCE&G. We own about 2,330 lights. Most of our lights are decorative lights. The rates paid by the type of lights, we're only installing Cobra heads now, 150 watt Cobra heads, $9.91 a month. The Cobra heads with 400 watts is $17.71. And the decorative lights are a little more different. We average about $27 a month. Some of them could be $34 or $5 a month. Some of them could be a little cheaper. It depends on what kind of pole you put in, what kind of base, what kind of light. Is it, is it the light or is it the just it, the coverage on those are overall, right? I mean, that's that's more than just the power, isn't it? Yes, the decorative lights is we're leasing the lights light, yourself the and, the, and the light, that's the pole, and everything. We stopped that process about probably eight or nine years ago, and we only want to own any decorative lights that we've owned. So we okay. average... The 1771 is uh, decorative? No. no. Which, Those are just the Cobra heads that hang over the street. That's the ones you want because they provide enough wattage and they're good security deterrent. We currently add average about 68 light additions per year. Neighborhood calls and said they've got some dark spots. Police department calls said they've got some dark spots. We'll go out and evaluate the neighborhood, make recommendations to council, and add them through that process. So our uh, average ele electric bill for the Cobra heads and the decorative lights is about $2 million each year. So what we did is we proposed of adding a $5 fee per month per partial for an estimated 45,000 partials. That includes exempt taxes, tax exempt, and everybody else. So it actually does include everybody. And we do consider that everybody benefits from a street light when you're driving down a street, no matter if it's in your neighborhood or not, as part of the safety issues for the city. And they, I failed to put up here how much we would generate, but I think it's about $2.4 million. Jeff, you're figuring. I think. It's, like a, it's like a cam fee? Am I close? To the yeah, 2.7. 2.7. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. So, but what you're saying is, is then, well, I mean, if you do it, then you need to go ahead and put lights everywhere not wait yeah. and right. if you're going to charge yeah. everybody you can't charge somebody if they don't have a street <laughs> light street lights almost all over the city so well yeah but i, I agree we need to since they're being charged we should put them where put them all over this city is uh, there a, i'm sorry yeah, thank yeah you. because I'm, I'm getting requests that there are strategic how far, pod yeah. spot how, how far how far are we, and I guess this might be, this might be as much a, a question of us and, um, versus uh, SC and G. How far are we away from being able to have smart lights? I mean, lights that, lights that, that dim uh, when there's no human activity or vehicular activity versus, what's that, Daniel? 2.7 million. Yeah, um, that, that dim when there's no activity and then obviously um, light up when there, when there is activity car approaching or individual approaching uh, that obviously helps you helps you save money and I'm, I'm thinking it's one it's one thing that to, to parcel out the the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility that everyone's it's another thing to tell people that you're actually getting added down uh, as well with this with this additional fee and, and I and I have that I'd have to go look it up I, the fees either and I'm going to talk about it's a Rome system is what we call it Bull Street has actually got some of the Rome units on it to work the Rome, we have to have, and now you're talking Ron Armstead would spin us around here right now. For the Rome system to work, you've got to have a direct line of sight back to something so we can actually control them. So the way Bull Street would work, if we would pay the Rome, which is 
two, either two or two dollars a month or five dollars a month, we would be able to control the the wattage of light that goes out to them. So we could at two o'clock in the morning we could drop them down to fifty or sixty percent or forty percent or thirty percent power, and then bring them back up. I don't know that noise or anything like that would bring them back up. The Rome system is available, I think, to put on regular street lights. But there again, you've got to have Wi-Fi signals and you're back to smart cities and where we need to get that stuff from. Yeah. We have That's looked at it. We, we've talked about putting the one in on Bull Street just to yeah, see how it works. Well, it's, I mean, there, there are different, I mean, as you mentioned, there's such a several, high traffic there's, there's several different types of systems right. being deployed all around the world. But again, um, if you're talking about some initial one-time expenses that get that 40,000 40, down automatically with some initial ex expenses, then spreading some type of a, of a, of a cam fee across uh, every parcel because that's that's a five bucks per month per parcel if you got a if you got a fifty thousand dollar house or a fifty million dollar building. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it's a uh, I mean I, li I, li I like I like the approach, but I, but I think we're gonna we we, we can't just be about about sharing the love. It's got to be about about uh, sharing some benefit too. Uh, I don't, I don't know what it, what it looks like to. It's it's kind of kind of what, what you guys have been talking about, Clint and, and, and the rest of y'all uh, on some smart city stuff. I'd just be curious to see what what if we can get us an idea as to what that costs, and at, and at very least maybe if if we were to do this together, with the first years, um, uh, five bucks a month. Dedicated to go ahead and upgrading our, our, our lighting and across the entire city with, with new smart technology that again should in theory bring down that two million and then we continue you know again we can then still spread 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 the uh, the burden in some way but people are getting a, a, a greater benefit and again we're smart city we also smart have city. some aspirations we've done real well in the Vista about switching over to LEDs but. And, and you know lowering the oh, wattage of that, but what happens when you lower? You know there was some discussion on North Main, the Kelvins on LEDs haven't come around enough to where you're still going to have that blue light, yellow light, and you've got to watch where you do it to make sure that they all, I would think, can s somewhat match. You just don't want to have one light blue and one light, or one light I call it blue, and then one light yellow. Yeah, we got all the uh, street lights are LED now, right? All, all the street lights, the uh, street more like traffic lights. Traffic Most lights. of it's about ninety percent. Traffic lights. Robert, <coughs> the 45,000 estimated or uh, estimated number of parcels, will there subsequently be an increase in the number of parcels? I would think with any annexation you would that you would. That's what I was thinking. And has there been some has there been some thought about how much of that will, will increase that number by? Or a large and annexation. annexation. Yeah, or a larger annexation. I don't know. But it remains at five five dollars. Where, where would you put the five dollars? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. That's yeah. actually what, one what, of our, our last line what, is talking what, about. Some of those things, some of those are the things we have to take into consideration. Is an actual method. We do have a couple of options. Not all of them fully thought out. Um, but we we do have some options. Could, some of them probably may be more favorable than others. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to balance that as well. I mean, if we're right going to be generating bills, the cost of that. And to adequately uh, define the areas that we, we, where we've got to avoid street, a number of street lights in areas where there is, where it's dark, da 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 da. Talk to me a little bit about it. You mentioned how we do that? Who makes that assessment? Sounds like a cat. So, at the minimum, what we do now is if a police department calls in, say they've got some dark areas, or if a neighborhood calls in, we'll do a neighbor neighbor neighborhood wide survey. Then we will bring that that map to council and add additional lights based on those recommendations. So the recommendations come to come to Public Works, go back to the neighborhood, to Public Works, to City Council for approval. 
and then to generally SCE. Right. 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 How much is the franchise fee between Crystal and Lake? Huh? The Lake? Five percent. It's eight million. Uh, no. Well, we don't talk about that. We, we, we don't. Yeah, they, we can't. The we can't total say. collected between all was approximately 13 million. 13 million from all of our franchises. From all of our franchises. And we have a couple. We cannot say that. What I'm getting at is the $2 million we pay them for the street lights is probably about an offset of what they pay us for our Well, not all $2 million goes to them. Well, it's $13 million. That's the total, total of all franchise fees. All the, the, the uh, biggest player in that respect, group. All due respect, they don't pay us anything. That's true. Right. Yeah, That's exactly right. 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 Ratepayers do. Right. And so in these. Uh, all of the franchise fees are that way. They're all passed through. The cell phone, cable, telephone. <coughs> There's a big savings in LED bulbs after you get the, after you buy the bulb. Well, I think too the challenge there too is is that some of these areas that we have lights, the reason we have the light and the wattage we have is for security. So the brighter, so the LED takes it takes away from some of that too. So it's a catch twenty two depending on where you're going. Now you know if you go down Gervais Street and you got seventy five street lights all in a row, then that might be a place for LED. But in, in, in my neighborhood, that corner lot with the 400 watt on the corner lights up the whole corner, which gives that added security. You take that away, then you've got a beam going down, and then you you got a lot of blind spots. Who, who services the 2300 city-owned street lights? Our staff does. SCG has the truck that comes through and replaces the bulbs on theirs. On theirs, correct. As we report them, the police department's done a good job of reporting them to us and sending them right back to SCG. Is, is there any, ma any method to the, the, the dispersion of, of, of the lights? I mean, are we all over the city, 2330, uh, certain areas? Or? Most of them are main thoroughfares. There are a couple neighborhoods, one of them being Elmwood Park that I think Missy did a few years ago. It was done with uh, Neighborhood Grant or something, I believe, Missy. Yeah, it was for their yeah, centennial. I, I, there may be one behind the VA. Newer ones, or well, I guess a, 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 a city-owned ones. I mean, those newer yeah, these are these ones. are city-owned, and then the university has city-owned decorative lighting. Talk about why we own decorative lighting. That whole twenty-seven dollars there. <laughs> Robert, so uh, an assessment for darkened spots has not been done. Has been done. We address every concern we get with a survey, yes. Right. Right. Yeah, so as it's raised, they don't survey generally. But and I, and I do want to point out, and I, I think this is worth I understand what you're trying to say. If you go to Shandon, all the power from Shandon comes from back lots. So if we add any street lights in Shandon, we actually have to add a pole to the street and it has to be fed from the backyard. So when, when Shandon calls, so everything's a little bit different. When Shandon calls, we actually go to the all four property owners on the corners and say, we're getting ready to put a light here, string a line from the backyard to front line. Is this what you want? So we do give them an option of what they want to add or not want to add. Now, generally, on most of the streets, it's got uh, power that's located on the front of the streets. We'll just install Cobra heads on. Service too, and we don't have any street lights on that strip. But we have post lights that individual properties put out. Like I have a little post light out on my driveway that I think is pretty. I don't want to pay the top dollar. Well, and I was gonna. That was gonna be my point. Is I, I think <coughs> going to Sam's original point. I think it's worth exploring. Um, I think we're we're going to need to mm -hmm. fully understand kind of where our lighting issues are and be able to address those in some manner because you're going to get people saying, well, you know, I'm paying for lights in the Vista or, you know, or that yeah. kind of thing. Um, and I know, you know, and Robert, you responded to the email a couple of weeks ago from Highland Forest, but 
we put the lights out there, but apparently she, it's not enough. She didn't enough. know they were added. She didn't know they were added, but I think she's thinking they're not enough because it's still, <laughs> to them, it's still dark. And so once we start talking about this, they're going to say, well, we need more lights. And you're going to have some communities who are going to say, well, we don't have enough lighting. So it's we're going to need to be able to address the equity right. of, you know, the lighting disbursement if this is going, if every parcel is going to pay the same thing. And that's my point. That's exactly my point. There are, er there are areas in communities that are dark. How do we get a better handle on being, um, let it be some uh, equity in our shining of light in this community? Count Councilman, I think I'd answer that by saying that you would do photometrics to make sure that the lighting is, is such of what they are, whether it's via 2.0 or yeah, whatever foot candles. But I think that what would happen is your $2 million electric bill would become, it could become $4 million at that time. It depends on how many you added. So, you know, with every light you add, you're going to add at a minimum 11 or $10 a month and possibly $17 a month. But how do we adequately shine light in places that are darkened? And I guess what I want to say, I guess what I'm asking is how do we how do we assess what we already have? Yeah, I think yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. I mean, so basically, um, you know, people don't call in the morning. That's correct. How 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 how? Because a lot of a lot of we folks still feel we voices. We don't assess. Don't feel voices. We don't assess. So yeah, so so, so right. how how do we? Assess where where there are maybe challenges, not, and that that probably requires a bit more, um, even more community engagement. Ed, it's going to fall maybe even falls more into well our the the, the our six person bailiwick here. Um, but uh, I've seen you guys a great article from Los Angeles, and obviously, you guys are trying to raise money. We're trying to spend it as as, as you, if you if you had to figure that out just as just as quickly, we're trying to spend it and figure out how we can save more and have a smarter and more effective city to spend it on. This is a um, uh, Article on Los Angeles converting the safe, of course, are much larger, but saving nine million a year with LED street lights, and they're doing some other stuff with EV charging stations and um, and the poles that they are upgrading the poles, some of the smart poles with that with that, with that 5G uh, infrastructure. It's the same thing. So that was mm. uh, it's a good article, very good article. So I like this a lot. Though. So I think well that that's really the kind of conversations we're looking at here too, in the sense of of what. What revenues do we offer, do we have, that help us to equitably distribute the cost of providing services? As you can see, property taxes by far don't cover the majority of the services provided, but then, two half of our par parcels are paying those property How many taxes. of those 45,000 are non, uh, non-profit owned or non- I think anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. It depends on who you ask. But, that, but, that, you that's, ask that's, that's worth, but that's worth. Property tax. But that's property. worth. Non-taxable. That's worth. This putting, is all parcels. That's worth putting another bullet on so so folks realize that this is, again, so as best as we can in the city with our DNA, uh, trying to share the responsibility. It's worth referencing that, I think. And there are a lot of questions, obviously, which I've raised with regards to the areas that don't have feel like they have the adequate service, how do you charge that rate to them? So those are the kind of conversations we feel like we needed to have with you all before we, I mean, we ourselves just decided this wasn't something to bring forward to you, but, but in terms of having these conversations, bringing forward to you everything that sort of comes our way. My big concern is if you put that thing on the water bill, the water bill is getting saturated right now. Yeah, yeah. that's one of our well, considerations. Too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Um, you'd be better off just assessing it once a year if you if you move forward on the property tax. Oh, I see. Smart C. And that's another consideration too. Is is this, this, this this investments you, in the this will get you on your, on your on your on your project. This will get you some more points. This will make it move up to a four. Going back to your first slide, I was surprised to see that we get one percent right. from fines and forfeitures. But that's that's a an unusually small bank, percentage. Thank Judge Toll. It's gone down as we as we do it constitutionally. As the general fund budget grows, of course, that number gets more you know insignificant. But 
Well, just we, we've we collected about the same. She no, she did not allow us to use third party to collect. We don't have the ability to collect, and 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 the process that she struck down to allow us. We got millions of dollars sitting out there that we can't collect because we can't use third parties to monitor and and, and get that money from those folks. Shut off debt for almost every day. You know, and what now? Shut off debt for close to almost every day. Hell, we can't even collect our parking fines as we know. Not when you don't have their address. So um, the next one we have is Parks and Recreation Fee Adjustment. You should have received a copy of the ordinance. Um, these are our proposals that Parks and Recreation has made. Randy will come up and talk to you a little bit more about these or answer any questions you have about Good afternoon. City Council, um, <clears throat> these fees that we're that are before you are in, in essentially in the swimming fees that we've been charging. It's just they never showed up in ordinance. Um, we needed to have some consistency and stability in in our in our fee structure, and these are the, the minimum fees that we could. Um, recommend charging a, a, a customer. The, the classes, camps, and programs, um, the culture, art, being in a new facility, we wanted to ensure that, you know, the fees were assessed that would be, you know, affordable based on the type of camp or specialty camp that, um, that served in our, in our art center. In addition to the, um, Classes. Oh. Yeah, under the classes, the art center wanted to in increase uh, the classes by by ten dollars per per class. When you, you're saying when the swim, this is what we're charging now. We just haven't codified it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. It was um, when it was never in you know in our ordinance. So that's that's what we're doing now. So we're yes, codifying sir. what we're doing now, yeah. but but not the camp. The camp fees are the, the art. Yeah, the camp, the camp, the classes were always in the um, in the the ordinance, but we're asking to, to increase the ten dollars there, as well as the um, <clears throat> as well as the camps here, not including our regular standard camps. We're, we're not increasing the fees in our summer camp program. At some point, you're gonna, arts camp. Some point you're gonna you're gonna school us on what it, what would happen at the art center. Like kind of exactly what the way forward there is. Yeah, not, actually, not right now. Not right but now. But I, I, had asked for that to be on, I think I'd ask for it, that to be on it, the future agenda. First. Okay, let's 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 figure that out in my inbox. That build up. Uh, my nice friends. Um, I've got a question. So, 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 so again, color fine. That's that's already the case. Top part, right? That's already what we're charging. Bottom yes, part, not this. This part um, here. Okay, but but the, yeah. these would be new or increases, right? Can you the bottom part? Okay. Can you clarify David, the so. swimming part? So that's you got the swimming, then you got where 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 is that? Swim. So what what do we do at um, through wellness? That says 1200 for two months, right? For swim team, um, right? Practice, yes, sir. Out, outside groups to come, outside yeah. groups, private schools, and, and not so only utilize Drew. Um, Drew fees is not shown on, on this screen in terms of um, swim team practice, uh, <clears throat> and I don't want to miss this quote. But I, I would assume that those those fees are are the same as we when we have a school practicing in in Drew Wellness. But oftentimes I don't believe we have swim team practices at at Drew because of the, the nature in which it is um, so many outside it's used. Yeah. Use what do we? What is we the eat fee? It. it causes grief when we do it. So yeah. Yeah. Frequent, yeah. frequent use. Yeah. Yeah. Grief. Davis. Yeah. Randy. Yes, sir. Uh, Swimming, in, in general, the, the three dollar fee. That's is that for John Q. Public kids. 
walk up. Three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars. No, he's yes. talking. You're talking about the individual. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought um, that was three dollars. Individual fee for swimming meets. Yeah. Those fees have not been been changed. Yes, that's for for the general yeah. public. I want to. Uh, what about the policy? Because last summer was the um, what were the complaints I got. The policy is that we don't turn a kid back because he can't afford to come in. Is that correct? Well, we we um, we try not to, uh, Councilman Davis, in terms of um, in terms of the fee. But we have no way of of, of assessing if we can establish some. Guidelines to determine, um, you know, affordability, and we can. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I thought we did that because Greenview was the first, was the big issue last year. Uh, the kids were turned back because they didn't have the money to pay, and I thought we tweaked that buy, policy. You didn't buy them passes. No, I didn't. Yes, it was brought to my attention. That I'm, for clarity, I, I mean, if we don't have, we one, don't I, have that. I think set in policy. I would suggest that we we kind of discuss that uh, because if you look at Greenview or you look at maybe well, I guess Greenview, the neighborhoods that border that <coughs> that, that, that that area and kids that would likely come may not. Have the jingles in their pockets, and the question is, how do we handle that and and maintain a positive uh, PR on that? Yeah, and that's been something we haven't been able to um, bring forth as a, as a proposal mm -hmm. um, to the council. You know, however, if that's if that's you know my charge, I'm I'd be willing to. Well, it, would it would certainly be to our benefit to at least have some conversation as it relates to Greenview and Goodwill, as it relates yeah, to kids that. who want to come. There has never, ever been a policy statement or anything referencing uh, kids who want to swim and can't affordably pay for it. Uh, there's never been a policy. No, sir. Wait, just, just, I'm sorry. Sir. No, no. I'm, it was just, just seemed to me. Um, I know you have to set some criteria, mm -hmm. whatever that criteria is, but right now we don't have anything. So we just make a random judgment that uh, someone comes, a kid comes to swim and can't afford to swim, we turn them back. And, and, and I think you know that that could very well inevitably lead to some other issues when they can't get in there. Traditionally, I've, you know, I've advised my staff to... Um, you know, monitor those situations where children come up and can't pay, and you know, try to you know involve them into um, the swimming uh, part without making it a, a, a broad announcement. But it just seemed to me, and I'm sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. No, no. But it just seemed to me that there ought to be some conversation, some inclusion uh, in the document. When that happens, what what are what are the things we need to look at? What are the yeah. things we need to do? What's the one, two, three, four uh, yeah. step process that you allow a kid to come in? You don't want to just turn me like that. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm I was sorry. just going to say, and I guess to that point, it, there definitely needs to be a process because I think that you a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, you run the risk of saying, okay, well, how do you verify that the kid, quote, can't pay? Right. Um, you know, is it a kid that's out without their parents and they just want to get in, they don't have money, or is it that they legitimately don't have the funds to pay? Mm -hmm. Then secondly, if they are there without adult supervision, do we want to run the risk of that liability of a child coming in, we've let them in free, and then something happens? That's, I think you're so, making a, that's an excellent point, um, Councilwoman Devine, because... Uh, we're, we're taking on a, a, a tremendous amount of liability. We had a babysitting service is what happened. Exactly. We're taking on a tremendous amount of liability. So careful. one of the things I would definitely, um, if, if that's a direction we want to go, that would need to be a requirement that the parent would have to 
be present with, with the child. And responsible, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I just hope we can open up the window so we have that kind of conversation and put on the table or put on paper what it is that's, that becomes a criteria for kids on the swing to swing sports. I think because of the if they have the opportunity, not all the time, not every day, to swim. I think you, you, you eliminate the possibility of those kids coming in after hours overnight in that pool, unsupervised, and somebody drowns. And the, the operative word, I think there, Councilman Davis, is um, the opportunity. Yeah. Where the opportunity may not be every day, but it can be a, 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 a select day. And okay. We allow that's, that's the key. We should make sure every child has, has every child should have access to public parks, right. and we need to make sure we have the structure in place to meet that. Yeah. And it's the same concept of you know what we try to do in our athletic program. Every child plays. Mm -hmm. We try not to turn the child away. And I think you know you guys do a good job and come up with absolutely the criteria that protects the public and, and that sort of thing. Um, any more questions on this screen? Here, I have one more screen to kind of please. With you. Sure. Okay. Uh, these vendor fees, these are fees that um, that's never been in our ordinance. When we have special events at Finley Park, the citywide special events or events that Parks and Recreation is kind of taking the, the lead on, and, and it brings what I consider to be you know greater accountability with uh, among you know our staff to ensure that we're consistent and fair across the board regarding various types of um, vendors. So you and know the fees that people are going to call us asking you to waive, that these are the same fees? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you these Man. are cheap. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are yeah. really cheap. So, 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 so what do we charge, we, so what we have to charge now, Randy? I know it's just kind of as we, as we go. We need some set just fees. apply. It's, it's, it has, then they the, charge This the brings... <laughs> Again, accountability to structure. To generally speaking, this, 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 you're going to always have to have your staff there doing something. Uh, right. Well so when, when we have certain vendors, like I can go to an event this weekend, and, and if there are 10 vendors and I know the different prices for those vendors, I, I should know how much revenue is coming in. Right now, I can't guarantee you all the always that, that has been the case. Randy, you, this has been the fees that are there now. These are new, is that right? Yes, sir. How was it done in the past? Well, again, we we didn't we didn't have it. Didn't have it. In so all this is new. Yes, sir. No fees. That, no, we're, we're, charging, we're charging. We're charging. We're charging. Fees, we're charging. But, but, we're charging. Yeah, we're charging. Yeah, we're charging. Yeah, we He's talking about codifying some type post, of standard fee. We we charged. Right. Yeah, we we charged, but, but having something that's. So fair. At the end of the year, I can be able to yeah. clearly give you um, uh, a record of, you know. How much revenue we brought in yeah. under various okay. vendors? But well, that's that, it helps me to it clarifies for me because when I look at this, I look at these being first time fees, and we're not doing anything right. in yeah. the past we, for fee. Uh, for we fee we have been charging fees, but then again, this is what the mayor said quantifies exactly what we're. What's doing. the difference between a snack vendor and a food and drink vendor? A soda and a pack of crackers. <laughs> That's a drink. The, the food is chicken wings and fries. Mr. Rick and Men. I, I guess my question is: before we move forward in the fee, I think it'd be it'd be very helpful to know that that whatever fee structure we do, I think they're low. I don't think it covers your costs. What it costs you to do it. If we're going, if we're going to do an increase, you need to cover what it actually costs because you're going to end up with a deficit. There is no revenue at that point. So I mean, we're not trying to make money, but we got to be at least cost neutral. So what I would suggest is before we go out and do this, you figure out exactly what it costs you to run these events, to oversee that, and then we put that fee structure into place because you're going to be short in your budget. Every year, if you're if, if you're still having to reach in your pocket to pay for it, it doesn't make any sense. And I think the public needs to know what the real cost is. You've got staff involvement. You've got to pay like that. It would, it would depend on the event, though. I mean, each each event yeah. would have yeah. a different right. calculation. Mm -hmm. Wear and tear on the facility. Okay. Say, for instance, um, let's talk about a, a specific event. 
for example, um, Kids Day. Okay, we have a number of, of vendors, food vendors, um, possible merchandise vendors that may sell, you know, some various types of um, clothing, um, arts and craft vendors that may set up and do face painting. Okay, and and these vendors, various types of vendors, will be assessed a, a fee. Now, of course, like um, Councilman Rickman said, it, it may not cover the cost <coughs> to have the event because, again, um, it's a city-run event. I'm not talking it's about... Not, it's not the cost of the event. It's the cost of your staff time. That's, that's yeah. what you need what to be calculating to. in there. Right. Can we, can we... I mean, obviously, we have time to come back to this. and I don't want to spend too much time on it. It would be um, worth getting an idea as to how this helps actually helps with your budget with some of the costs, maybe I don't know, I mean, Carl or, 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 or Frederick and just uh, be, get a sense. I mean, Cost analysis. Uh, you know, if you take if you take me and, and Tamika out to make sure you're going to save a whole bunch of money right there, uh, we, we got more. You take ice skating uh, out of it, you really save some money. Now, now you're going to meddling. You're going to meddling it's meddling. meddling. The, uh, but, um, but, I, but generally speaking, I'm comfortable with, with everything. I do have one question, though. A few years ago, we talked about. Uh, Miss, you about to say something? Can I change subjects? I'm sorry. You about to say something? Right. Sure. About about um, Chief Jenkins uh, being able to recoup some of their uh, expenses and fees uh, as they respond to accidents or respond to um, uh, uh, events that may be covered by insurance, and being able to uh, recoup some of those costs, um, particularly when, they, when there's a clearly at fault party. Have we have we given any more thought to that? That it seemed to be. It seems like there are a number of other communities that were are, uh, allowing the fire departments to recoup some of those uh, expenditures, and, and I think we we I think we, we I think we we balked on it. I'm not sure why. We had that conversation about a year ago, two years ago. Yeah, it's been a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's and, chief and, brought in, and, and, it may, and it may and it may and it may and if there's some if there's some conferring or discussion, you want to talk to talk to Aubrey about it? I'd, I'd like to put it back on the table. If, if <laughs> Well, we, we, we did yeah. institute the, um, ha the hazard. Hazard, had, hazmat fee was introduced. We did, we did that. We did that. Right. I remember that this one. This fee that you're talking about, we actually had some other kind of conversations that we still plan to have with you during this budget cycle. Okay. That's fine. I just, but, I'd, love, I'd, I'd love to see it again, uh, particularly there were several state communities even around the state that were that were allowing. Um, I, think who's doing it? I think in your discussion, I think it'd be helpful for us to also understand, you know, at the end of the day, EMS is, should be, since both city and county residents are paying for that service, they should be the one to respond to accident before than, than our fire truck. And, you know, that's been, our fire trucks end up responding, being first responders, so a lot of it. Do you remember yeah. several years ago when we had that discussion, the firemen actually liked being the first responder. I remember they were the ones who... Yeah, but okay, right now we it, it is if if I think Aubrey came in here and showed us what it cost him for all those calls and oh, he's getting yeah, no oh, yeah. and yeah. and I guess the the question comes in is how, who who both of them can't claim insurance or, or if we should I should provide EMS services over that's the right. story yeah. that's, 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 that's a conversation that's a, I think I mean, that, or that yeah, we that, should that's right. a whole, that's a whole other yeah, conversation that would, yeah. so but let's okay also all around Parks and Rec. So on the other part with the arts center, uh, Randy is working with Jan Alonzo and other staff to fix to fix that. And I've I've actually responded back to several. I gave emails everyone, I give everyone your cell phone number, Jeff. And, and someone, a, a lawyer. <laughs> yes, I've had calls and emails. And I don't know take, if, if Teresa's looked at this, but I had a, an attorney suggest to me if there was something that maybe utilizing the Parks and Rec Foundation as a yes, mechanism. We've we've looked at that, but we're also yeah. looking at. A, the organization that's right next door um, has an well, interest in Columbia. assisting us as well. Okay. well. I certainly don't want to get this conversation with Chief Jenkins and that conversation we had two years ago. Lost the conversation. Yeah. So I would oh. hope. Uh, one, of, one of the areas that is implementing that kind of plan is Sumter County. And uh, so I just hope we don't get lost in translation and forget that we've had this conversation. Hopefully we can resurrect it Chief Jenkins back in the Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Can we just add one more thing that was just before that? Yeah. Well, Randy can do it. Basically, what, what, what I 
think is trying to be clarified here in terms of this would not necessarily generate new revenues because these fees are being charged currently. Sure. So in this case, and, and those revenues, right, and these revenues go to the general fund, and, and Randy supported it, Parks and Recreation supported our general fund. So it's not a not a uh, impact on his budget, per se, other than helping us to. There's no new net revenue, but we're just talking about standardizing and. and, and, and uh, this is right here, this charge is for service, 11%. Yeah, but it That's does affect his portion. budget if we're not collecting enough to cover it. So in next year's budget, he's already running a deficit. Which is probably true for a variety of our charges right. for services. And so we need to start looking at that, um, you know, in another county. To get the power hooked back up in your building, you got to buy a permit for $120 just for the power company to come out. And the reason is, is because the inspector has to inspect. They cover their costs where, you know. Right. So I think we do need to be looking at as we make these, are we actually getting the cost? We're not here to make money, but to, to keep that at cost neutral. And I think that's part of the conversations I think we've, we, we're have we trying to have with council as a whole in the sense of, where is the desire? Is it is it to get to more of a cost recovery recovery mode? Um, I mean, knowing that the general fund supports a number of services that we provide that are fee based services, and how do we balance those out? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think, I think uh, again, I'll get this more information back to you during the cost analysis. So, so just be, yeah, and I, I wouldn't say spend those with a whole lot of time on it, but. Get a sense, and if uh, I mean, obviously, I think these fees are, you know, I'm fine with them. Some of them are, are pretty modest, um, and obviously, also built to meet the needs of the vendor as well. I mean, you don't, you don't want to charge an arts and crafts vendor 500 bucks, you know, um, in a prayer for them to make 500 bucks, you know, a, a week. But it, it probably wouldn't hurt to have these have a good idea as a you know, folks work hard, so making sure that we're accounting for their time. So as far as Have next you steps, what some of these guys charge for their stuff? <laughs> They're artisans, Daniel. So as we look at next steps in terms of where we go with with today's conversations and where staff <laughs> focus its efforts and its time, our time, in terms of the street lights fee, if there's a desire to kind of go there, we need to talk about um, methods of collections that we've already heard. You know the. the Desire to not put it at, as an item on the water bill for understandable absolutely, reasons. Absolutely not. Um, and then that leaves us with you know some other options that we have as well. Of course, we'd have to consider a, a draft an ordinance, determine what would be an effective date, um, which the effective date may be really more predicated on the methods of communications and getting that system set up or that process set up, I should say. Of course, bringing anything back for city council to review, and then we'd of course have to have a public hearing. Um, so at this point, it's just a matter of how much more time and effort is there to, to consider this, or do we kind of wrap it up into the other conversations that we're sort of had with regards to looking at the smart city initiatives and what we look there, especially as we look at I'm areas open, of... I'm open to a smart street lights fee that, that obviously also focuses on the inclusion elements that, that you mentioned, making sure that you know, if we, we can do an assessment and make sure that, that the entire place is lit up and that... Um, I mean, we, we just can't make, and obviously we're talking about sharing the, the, the burdens here uh, and, and obviously addressing a, um, a, a budget issue, which I mean, makes our CFO very happy. But at the very same time, I'm not sure we can, uh, I don't think we can make any, any decisions going forward without thinking more about how we're using technology to make this, the city more effective and more efficient and, 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 and save us and our taxpayers and ratepayers money and we know that there are several different technologies out there now that can help us do just that I'm not sure how we'd miss this opportunity to not just do that but also make it clear to our citizens that this is a significant benefit uh, to them it can't just be uh, like, a, like, a, like a condo can be uh, that we're just spreading the, spreading the burdens uh, uh, to everyone yes yeah I, I could support that uh, one of the uh, um, challenges folks have in the neighborhoods. You go in certain neighborhoods, you don't see people walking once it gets dark because they don't have that feeling, that sense of feeling safe. Lighting does that to folks, brings more people out. I mean, you don't have to be out till 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, but 
early evenings when it's just getting dark, folks stop in their neighborhoods. They don't go out. They don't walk. Just don't walk unless they go to a park to walk. And then the expectation is that the park is well lighted. But in terms of certain streets, they don't get it. You know, when uh, I go out with Robert and the guys, we take the neighborhood folks in a van and ride through that neighborhood so they can we can look at dark spots uh, and what it would take to illuminate a certain area. And it's not always a new light. Either. It's, it's cutting back the trees and things like that. So I think uh, this gives people, as long as we can help folks feel more secure where they live, they'll be supportive you know, at a modest, for a modest fee. Like this. I, I think you're making a mistake calling it a street light fee. Yeah, because that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would call it a smart, smart city fee. Smart city fee. Well, yeah. That's what, and that's what it is. Yeah. Oh, you well, well. In the article I sent you, I read it on Los Angeles. I mean, all the new polls. We're not talking necessarily about a bunch of new polls, but all the new polls that they put up were um, able to uh, to help with their four G infrastructure citywide. So, so yeah, you'd be able. To, you know, oh yeah. So now five G. We're talking about five G in twenty twenty. There's a real opportunity to watch that to have the fee to meet uh, a smart city needs that benefit the entire uh, uh, city. At the very same time, if we're doing the smart with LED and heck, solar and some, well, actually that 20, that, that 2 million 40,000 go down, you know, over the same course of time. So uh, it's for deploying new technologies that literally help keep people safe and alive in, in the communities. Um, let's play this a little bit more, but it'd be great to have um, something we can do this budget year. But this is but this is about being a smart city, effective city. And certainly there are you know there are limit probably revenue options, but then also two cost saving options. Mm -hmm. This could be both. On the parks and recreation, it sounds like that before you would want us to move forward. Um, public hearing wise on that one, expectation would be to have that one sooner than the budget public hearing simply for the fact that the season's going to be starting in May. But in this case, it sounds like there's some requests for additional information before we move forward with the public hearing or should um, what the direction would be. May, May, May's, May's a couple months away. We should be able to cover. You know, We'd have a public hearing in April. Yeah, I, I think in, uh, um, yes. That's, I think we could still move forward. But sure. I think the two, the, two, the two issues that are raised were, one, let's make sure we know what we're spending. So at least we're at least addressing that in some way. And just make sure that, you know, how, how it's formulated. And you, you guys do a really great job across all your programs already, Randy. Let's just make sure that it's clear how and when, you know, children have access to, you know, and families that may not be able to afford stuff have access to the parks. I think we need to articulate it in some very clear and simple way so that um, we can do it. It will be very helpful. I think that's the real issue. Okay. And the hard issue. Well, I would suggest you look online and check the other cities. See what kind of fee structure they have. Yeah, I think those. Uh, I agree with Daniel. These those fees are look penetrated. Yeah. Okay. Thank y'all. Thank you very much. Thank y'all. And we'll come back some more talk about the fire stuff too. Yes. Is that back on the we'll bring those two. I mentioned here and some numbers on EMS too. Just I'm trying to get people. We'll add that to it. Keep it all wound up, but it'd be worth the worth the site. Thank you, Missy. I will see the MS van showing up versus the fire truck. A lot less expensive for sure. Great. Yes, sir. Next item, item two, is the comprehensive annual financial report, Bud. otherwise known as the CAFR, fiscal year ending June 30, 2017. Presenting will be Mr. Bud Addison, audit hey. senior manager for Webster Rogers. Hey, Bud. Good afternoon. And yes, I believe all of y'all have. Good afternoon, Mayor. Always a pleasure to be here. Look forward to this so much that I'm willing to extend right off the bat Mr. Duval's request to come back again once he accumulates his 101 questions <laughs> and we'll address those specifically. Otherwise, today we'll hit a high-level approach. I have no yellow tags on my pages because I didn't get this till. First of the meeting. 
you know, this is such <coughs> good reading that I don't know why the city's website didn't crash as soon as it was put up there <laughs> with some people just wanting to read it. Um, maybe we need to add more pictures. I don't know. But a couple of good points today were brought up that's um, going to incorporate into this document that, that may add some clarity. It may add some concern or Jan may have a heart attack before the stress test and don't, won't need the stress <laughs> test. So with that, I'd like to thank Ms. Alonzo and for her staff, professional cooperation and courtesy that they showed during this process. And there was an unmodified opinion rendered. So we get that out of the way. Um, hitting the high points, if you look on page 23, on table three, down at the bottom, that is a comparison between 17 and 16 on your water and sewer. The change in net position, you will see that the net position or net profit, if you want to use that term, decreased about $4 million from 17 and 16. So that is probably not one of the highlights you wanted. On page 24, however, though, you see the same table, table four is the parking fund, where the parking fund did show a surplus for 17 of about 246,000 versus about a half a million dollar deficit in 16. Well, I think the million one of revenue is more significant than anything else. That is, fund. and I think a lot of that, um, you just have to walk the streets of Main Street to see why that million additional revenue came in. A when lot did, more. When did L start? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so. It's a combination. Daniel paid his growth yes. and management. <laughs> she collected in uh, cash. Good, 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 good revenues hurt feelings. Good, good, good job. Sometimes a a change is is beneficial. You know, saying we've always done it that way it not always a good sign. On page 31, I would like to call your attention to the middle of the page. There's two captions, net pension liability and net OPEP obligation. You can see there's three columns there. The, the left is the governmental activities, which is basically everything except water and sewer, parking, stormwater, hydro, parks and rec camp, your enterprise type funds. All of your, your general funds, special revenue, capital projects. You can see that the total liabilities of the governmental activities is about $345 million. Out of that, the net pension liability is $151 million. And that is the state retirement. That's just a paper figure for us, though, isn't it? By law, the state does not, the state has that obligation. From an accounting standpoint, it really shouldn't be on your your balance sheet, except Gasby said it was going to be. Where the concern is for the city, I think, and other participating employees, is that that liability is going to have to be paid. And that's going to come through current contributions. And that the city is contractually required to pay. That's the 18% we're going to be paying on our employees for their pension. For this year. Right. Now, the liability, these are not comparative statements, and I, and I wish they were, but the liability, the city's liability increased approximately $20 million from 2016. New, new retirement laws? No, just... It's a combination of an actuarial study based on, you know, the investment return and the current 
contribution. For whatever reason, and thankfully so, the general market has been good the past two or three years. And if we're having, if the retirement system is having trouble keeping up in the good years, if it just gets to moderate one year, it's going to be difficult. That hundred and fifty-one million dollars is a figure that's calculated by the state and given to the city. And that, it is based on it is based on an actuarial study. That's what I asked. Done by people, not by the city. That is correct, yes. Now, just to be clear, that 151 is for the, the governmental side. The business side has 51, so the total city liability, if I may use that term, is about $203 million. That's a chunk of change. Refresh my memory on the business side. That's the, that's Water and sewer, parking, stormwater. Hydroelectric, they, they wouldn't have any because they have no employees. But, uh, anything not general fund? Any, anything not general fund, special revenue, capital tax. Mainly, but it's primarily your general fund. But that's, that's a big liability. And while the city is not obligated per se for the liability, that liability will have to be satisfied by a good portion of current contributions. And so the rate that is keep has been increasing the past couple of years is probably likely to continue to increase in the foreseeable future. The other one is the city responsibility, and that's the OPEB obligation. That's going to get a little more involved, and we'll talk about that a little later. Um, but that $53 million is a, an approximate estimate, and it's based on an actuarial study that the city does perform. Um, you can see outside of your revenue bonds and your geo debt, those are the city's two biggest liabilities and even the pension liability exceeds the bonded indebtedness in the in the general fund for the governmental side. I think that would be would be a concern of mine going forward is that the, each year the cost is probably going to increase. And it's also going to impact a greater portion is probably going to be passed along to the employer employees, which is going to indirectly impact their side. Probably you would ask two biggest concerns that I would have with cost going forward. It would be health care and then the retiree. Oh, I'm sorry, retirement and there's a reason that most of the private companies are dropping pension plans or have dropped. Is that your advising council? Is that your advising council, Doug? <laughs> I thought it was a no comment. <laughs> it was a grin. You know, maybe you could look at some wellness incentives or other things. Moving to page 35. Looking at the bottom of the page in the far left column, <coughs> see where the, the general fund finished at a deficit of about two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars or seventeen, and that included a one-time charge of two and a half million dollars received on the sale of the parking garage. Just, just for clarification, so had that six hundred thousand in surplus. That went towards the eclipse and all that stuff been left in, we could have finished in a positive. Is that my understanding? I'm going to say potentially. I'd have to take a look to see if all of I got the disclaimer all that was spent, but it, it could have yes. So it really wasn't a surplus when, when when we spent all that money. 
I think about how to answer that. So carefully, that's what I would well, suggest. You know, Definitely. It, it, it's it, you know each year when we spend those funds, any general fund surplus funds, or whether whether they're surplus or not, when we spend them outside of what was originally budgeted, that does have the potential because it's revenue that came from a prior year. So in the current year, that has the potential to cause a deficit if you hit your expenditures and revenues, you know, smack on. Then anything that you spent from the prior year's revenues um, that built up that general fund will reflect as a deficit in that current year. So now that I'm sure I've confused everyone, maybe Bud can explain that better. You could substitute instead of saying budgeted surplus, you could say budgeted deficit because, like Jeff said, if the budget is exactly on and we all know that it's not going to be, then you are going to run a deficit for the current year because you are spending money that is on the balance sheet and not on the, the revenue and expense side for the current year. You're spending cash in your, your pocket. We would never do that, though. And I think you see that often reflected uh, in the hospitality tax. When we spend those extra funds from prior years, that has the potential to show as a deficit in the current year, unless you have enough growth to cover it. But the deficit in the county services um, line of $3.1 million, that is in fire service? That is the fire service. It um, finished, it started at 3.1. The fire service fund had a surplus of 643000 and so the, the deficit, accumulated deficit, dropped to $2.5 million. Fund for this year, were we even or above even for this year, or would we, would we supplement the county this year, or is that a carry forward deficit? That that is a carry forward deficit. The, the fund itself finished with a current year surplus. Okay. So if, if the county wanted to make us whole and pay their full obligation, they owe us two and a half million dollars, two point four million dollars. I could see where you could come to that conclusion. <laughs> that would be an easy, easy conclusion to reach. We just need to send them a bill like they do us for the jail. Jeff, send them an invoice. Would we'll look at page forty. Just and this, I'm sorry, but I'm curious, Jeff. Have you looked at their capital? What does their capital show as far as fire services? Does it show a debt? What was the question? I was just wondering if Jeff has ever looked at county's capital. I, I'm just wondering how they show it. Do they show it as a debt? No, I don't. They do. They, they would not. They would show it as they are only obligated to pay whatever the set for the, the fee is for the year. And that would be an expenditure for them. Yeah. They would not have if, a debt. If, they, if we had budgeted for 20 million. That's all they're going to reflect to show that they sent us twenty million. Okay. Looking at page forty, that's the the cash flow statement, and that's the lifeblood I think of, of most any business or fund. You see where the Cash decreased in 2017 in the water and sewer fund by approximately $40 million. Now, some of that was offset by the $27 million in purchases, but the bottom line is that there's $13 million actual cash decrease in the, the water and sewer fund. Which page are you on, Bud? Page 40. It's in the first column, water and sewer. Facility fund down at the bottom is the, the decrease, the thirty-nine million. It has brackets around it. Now, mm -hmm. some of that money would go to capital expenditures, debt payment, um, that sort of stuff. But there was probably a net thirteen million dollars spent 
over what the actual cost of training is. And I know that going forward, your debt service for the water and sewer fund is going to increase because I think there's one $81 million bond that do we know, do we know what, that was, what that was spent towards? Yeah, actually, so during our rate study discussions the last few years, we've talked about spending cash, more cash on uh, projects and having a target cash number. So we had anticipated we'd be spending more of the cash we've accumulated instead uh, out of, for the 120. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of, uh, of the breakout right now, but we knew <coughs> we would spend cash. We generally call it PAYGO. When you hear Robert yeah. talking about it, but when he's talking about it over the last study or two, we've looked at spending not just cash that was coming from operations, but additional cash that we had in the system. Because y'all may recall we have a cash target, so we never hit that exactly because every year there's fluctuations between revenue and expenditures. But we did anticipate we'd spend cash, um, and when we're spending that cash, that's less debt that we're issuing. Okay. Looking at a, on page 96, and this is a couple statements that GASB has issued. I want to bring to your attention, one of them deals with OPEB, and I'm not going to get into the technical side of that because it's a bear, but it is similar to what page, 96. 96. page 96. I'm sorry. Thank you. When to get the retirement or the liability on the city's balance sheet, it requires a calculation and a study. And I think it's safe to say that it's one of the things that contributed to some of Miss Alonzo's health problems is trying to figure out, <laughs> calculate the interest because it's not an easy calculation. Well, now the city is responsible because the GASB has brought OPEB plans into that same discussion. And OPEB is going to be very similar to the retirement. And to put it in perspective, when the retirement standard was adopted, it went from like a one-page note disclosure to an eight-page note disclosure. So, looking at the same thing with the city's OPEP plan, and it's going to require additional complexities and more work capturing information. And so, looking at that. But, saving the best for last, and I'm glad Mr. Anderson's still here because I loved it when they used the term streetlights, lease. From SCMG. Gasby Statement 87 entitled Leasing. What this is going to do, and it is driving the corporate world bonkers, <laughs> is that currently, if the city, the city does rent, I think 1225 Lake on a five-year lease from maybe First Citizens outside. That's correct. When the rent payment is made each month, that amount is spent, say it's $1,000 rent a month. You debit rent expense for $1,000, and cash is credit to $4,000, and you go on your merry way. Now, when the city executes that five-year lease, they have to determine the cumulative amount of payments. And at the inception of the lease, say it's $120,000 over a five-year period, the city would debit to its balance sheet a like-to-use asset for $120,000 and would have a liability on its balance sheet of a like amount. It is basically saying we're financing that five-year period. Now, each month, 
you would recognize a portion of that right to use assets, probably be close to the current rent expense that you're paying. So from a financial statement P&L standpoint impact, it won't be much different. The kicker is, and I'm not being disrespectful because I think the total head is at one end of the snake. That, that's all I know about it. But you think Robert knows whether a debit goes on the left or the right? <laughs> and he's got those leased assets, SC and G. Do they fall under this standard? We're just trying to capture everything that's applicable, and you can't wait until two months before the end of the year that this statement goes into effect, which goes into effect <coughs> two days after Ms. Alonzo's retirement, <laughs> whatever that day may be. That's in 11 years. Yeah, that's in 11 years. <laughs> you, look at, you look at it and say, oh, my God, we didn't think about those things. We didn't know about it. The hard part is going to be to look at everything. I think you're talking everything from Pitney Bowes postage machine, basically any lease that is more than month to month would fall under this standard. Mm. And it is not necessarily, it is not as complex to implement as the OPEB will be, but it is a lot more I'm continuing in gathering up the information. How about telephones? If you are renting them, yes, sir. If it's a, a five year lease, if Public Works is leasing a, renting a street sprinkler for five years, that follows in. Basically, during the period of the lease, you've got, a lack of a better term, but a more commonly known, a depreciable asset for that. And it's similar to tracking city-owned property and recognizing depreciation over the life of that asset. And it's causing a major expense to Corporate America is going as far as just being able to identify all the things that they lease. And where is a central repository? And who keeps that? And how do you how do you identify? I think it's going to be a bear. It is. Yes, being its infinite wisdom. Mm -hmm. And and so, but on here you have effective um, December of 2019, which would be for our We're beginning after 19. So right. the year cities July 1st, 2020. 20. But I'm telling you now. So I can say I told you so when you waited till the day before to start preparing for it. Because it's it's on the records now in posterity. I mean it's it's gonna take some time to implement, I think. And just how do you go about tracking and getting the information? Moving along with that, page 110, we'll move into the second, and this topic actually was discussed, decided on before the meeting. Y'all just helped out with a couple of points. There is, you will see, looking across in the various columns, the fourth column, Parks and Recreation Fund, I'm on page 110. Come down to the bottom of the page, and there's $32,500 in brackets. 
meant that for 2017, your parks and recs camp operated at a deficit of $32,000 approximately. And they started the year with an accumulated deficit of 64000 So this deficit had been, has been running for a couple of years. It is it's not a lot of money to the city, except we all were talking about making sure that you recover the, the cost and, and these fees. And, and those, are, yeah, and those are two different buckets as well, too, because we're talking about we, we did scale up significantly the number of kids participating and participating for free. I mean, so keep that in mind. Yeah. I'm, not sure how, I'm not sure how that's reflected in the books, but we have um, potentially. Given up the wasn't kids revenue. participating in programs. Uh, it wasn't uh, revenue generated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got kids playing all types of sports, not having to pay for it, which I thought I believe is still consistent with what we want to do. But that's important to know. Yeah, Thank you, Bud. Tell me. But I'm going to, on page 115, this is the various internal service funds. They all operated at a deficit in 2017, and the risk management fund, which includes the OPEB <coughs> expense, is at about a $5 million deficit. I know there has been some talk about whether the, the city would like to establish a trust fund for the OPEB, and I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether you should or you shouldn't. We'll say that the reporting requirements of the new standard for a trust fund is a lot more involved and a lot different. So you would would be the cost of administering that trust fund that is under disclosures would be more. There are those that think you will see a decrease in the amount of, of trust fund. You know, the proverbial they, whether they're right or not, it remains to be seen. I, at the end of the day, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. The city still has some liability. Well, you don't have the ability to invest the fund if, if we keep it internal. So you, you're losing whatever opportunity you have to earn income off of that invested fund. That is, it is, it is not, you are correct, because there is no, legally there is no money set aside, but it also impacts to what degree, I don't know, but I feel certain that to some degree that having that money available impacts the bond rate favorably. Because that money, not saying that it, that it would be, but if push came to shove, it could be used for anything that the council wants it to be used for. Well, if you used an existing trust fund, geared towards making those disclosures for all of the members of the trust fund, wouldn't that be uh, a, a better way to go? Ask Ms. Alonzo about the disclosures on the retirement system. That would It would be the equivalent. I mean, it it's, would still be more, it's more burden. But I, it's not, I'm not advocating for it or against it. I'm just saying that the record keeping increases with a trust fund versus a non-trusted fund. That concludes what I wanted to discuss and unless y'all have any specific questions. Some more questions for Bud? We look forward to doing our reading. It's going to be fun. He's going to come back for a, a supplemental. Thank you. Thank you, man. If y'all have uh, questions and things that you have, if you want to send those to me.
report just the pages and page <laughs> numbers. And I can't remember how we did it last year. I think we set page numbers and put the questions on it. Yeah. And we'll, we'll respond back to all those as well. Okay. It's minor on the staff. I don't have a hyphen, and Mrs. Name is transposed. They have the interest in it. Uh, the first part, I don't have a hyphen, and Missy's name is transposed. Mrs. Gentry. I think you got Hurricane Matthew spelled wrong, too. Well, since I'm dyslexic, I'm not going to ping y'all on spelling, but I, I do have several questions. Hey, a blind squirrel gets a nut every once in a while. Might have been the first time I corrected anybody on it in English, let alone a paper. Thank you, bud. Thank you, we'll bud. be in touch. Thank you very much. Starting with page 29 through 96. <laughs> Mr. Jacob? Yes, ma'am. So, number three. <clears throat> On our agenda is the boil water notification process. And that will be Mr. Joey Jacob. Well, I was excited. Director. I thought it said boiled peanuts. <laughs> Erica's going to get it. Don't touch her stuff. <laughs> Erica, you can get the ruler out. That's right. You need a big one. Close that one. Okay. So today I'm really coming just to update on full water notification process um, with some recent um, activities. Um, we had some full water notifications um, that went out and there may be some confusion how we do it, why we do it. So really what I'm, I'm just going to start with, what is a full water advisory, what is a full water notice, and why do we send them out? So. The, a bull water advisory is really just an, a, a, to advise that there is a potential for contamination to be in the system. The bull water notice is we issue those when it is confirmed. We've done testing and we've confirmed that there is contamination. Uh, I don't know, I could tell you when we've done a bull water notice, but we do a number of bull water advisories. And the main reason we do bull water advisories is for water main breaks or activities where we have to cut pipe. We reduce the pressure in our system that it affects uh, pressure in the system, affects pressure to the customers. And water main breaks, there's multiple reasons why we have main breaks. It could be a contractor hitting our line. It could be, um, it could be just the aging infrastructure. You know, recently, the temperature fluctuation that we've had um, can, can lead to boil water, um, excuse me, to, to water line breaks. Uh, pressure fluctuations, uh, we may have surges in the system that are caused by just operation of a hydrant. I mean, improperly opening and closing a hydrant can cause pressure fluctuations that can cause water line breaks. So there's a number of things that can cause them. And when we do have them, we, if it, we reduce the pressure in the system below 20 pounds of pressure uh, for, a significant, for any length of time, and it affects a customer service, and by precaution, we put out what the bull water advisory. That doesn't mean every time we have a water line break, we do a bull water advisory. It's got to get to the point that it affects the pressure in the system, that it affects the, the customer, and it's a potential for contamination entering the system. So that's just a little education as to why we do it. Other reasons we would do it is if we have a complication in the treatment process at our plants, um, we would have to do a bull water advisory for that. Or if we have a significant loss of pressure, or a loss of pressure in a significant part of our system, like during the flood, we had a number of water line breaks, and we had a pressure reduction, no pressure in some areas in our system. So as a precaution, we did a boil water advisory. We did the required testing because all tests came back good. We never had to do a boil water notice. So, so the repeal process, we do a boil water advisory. We make the repair, uh, lab goes out, pulls samples, we run a flush, uh, flushing point, lab goes out, pulls samples. It takes about 18 hours to get the samples back, so it's about a 24-hour process for us to pull samples, 
get samples, and repeal the notice. So that's Is that typically a third party process. We do we do all our sampling. You get a certified laboratory. That's right. That's right. Our, our water plant has a DHEC certified lab, so we're able to do all of our sampling internally. So it's about a 24 hour process just to collect the samples and turn them around. So that's typically why it takes that long for us to repeal an advisory. Um, and it's very rare that we get uh, contamination come back or bacteria test or total coliform or anything that comes back that requires us to extend that advisory. Um, but, but we do sample, do the required sampling, and we send out the proper notification. So that's just a little education of what an advisory, a notice, and what the repeal is. So the notification process. All bull water advisories, we have a standard notification process that includes DHEC, our customer care, um, all employees. We send out an email that includes all city employees. Uh, we have contacts for our school districts. We have contacts for towns, um, you know, Town of Forest Acres, Arcadia Lakes, you know, our, our contacts with those towns we contact, counties, Richland County, Lexington County. And we include local media in that. So that's all the major local media stations, uh, including the state newspaper and even uh, radio, WVOC, I believe. So all water line, or excuse me, bull water advisories include those. When we have a small area, less than 25 affected residential customers, not including a business or a school or a restaurant, we can do door hangers. So if it's a small break, our area that uh, a break that affects a small area will do will do door hangers. Now a larger area we also include Nixel and Everbridge. We utilize Nixel still because we still have some folks that are signed up to receive uh, the Nixel notification. But the main reason we use it is it pushes it to our Twitter account and it pushes it to our Facebook account, and that's probably where we hit most people seeing it. So. Uh, that's one of the main reasons we continue to use uh, Nixle in the notification process. Everbridge is uh, what 911 uses. Uh, we've been using that for a couple years now. Everbridge allows us to reach an emergency uh, contact database, but really it, it really hits folks who take the time, go in and sign up. Nixle and Everbridge, you go in, take the time, go in and sign up, and there's a number of things that you can get notified for under Everbridge, so I'd recommend if you haven't done that, to do that. But water and sewer notifications is one of those things under Everbridge. So, so Joey, how do you sign up for Everbridge? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and then we can go into that. And But to go back, okay. the biggest question I get from folks is why don't we use reverse 911? That is the Everbridge. That is Everbridge. That is Everbridge. Okay. And but they have to sign up, so it's not like automatic. You just have to yes, sign up to be on the list. And even... You know, Everbridge, and I can't tell you what database they get contact information from. It comes through the county, uh, through the reverse 911 process. I don't know if it, I'm not sure how they build that database. But if they're in that database, they'll be contacted. But a lot of people don't have home phones anymore. Um, so, that, and that's what's going to be in their database. So, my recommendation is to go on, it takes just a few minutes to go online, and this is the process here. Um, there's a, links on several p parts of our our website where you can go in and sign up. It takes just a few minutes, and you can you can have multiple locations too you, with Everbridge. You don't have you know you can give it multiple addresses to notify you. So you say you want to have an address for your home, an address for your school, or your business. You can enter all those addresses in there, and if something happens within that area, it will contact you. So. All this information is on our website. Uh, I believe there's a link from our customer care. There's a link from our bull water advisory uh, what, part of our website. And I believe there's also, I believe 911 may have some notification in there as well. So. And my last slide here is just for more information. We do have a specific site on our on the utilities and engineering website, Columbia Water website, that talks about water bull water advisories. It includes links to you know to DHEC. If you get a bull water advisory, what do you do? You know, talk, talk, tells you 
how long to boil the water, um, the different um, parts of that process. But it also has uh, links to all past boil water advisories and all past boil water repeals. So um, it, there's there's a couple things on our website that can give you a little bit more information um, to, to provide to customers. So yes, ma'am. Um, and the other thing, I guess. Um, have we made sure we've done the customer care center training um, about a year ago? And, and Missy helped me over the weekend. You know, there was confusion in my neighborhood about a boil water advisory, and people were calling, and they were all getting different information depending on who answered the phone, and everybody was just very upset about the fact that calling the city wasn't helpful. Um, so have we fixed that and made sure that they're trained and get the information that's accurate and they're giving it out in the same same way? The, there has been training. Uh, what customer care gets is they get the, the email that, that basically gives the basic outline of why we have a boil water advisory and whether or not it's in effect or have, has been repealed. So it depends on, you know, they have been trained to respond to that, but they're not going to have the detailed information that the guys in the field may have. So they're going to be limited on the what type of questions they can answer, but they can provide a, they're trained to give a, a proper basic response, but depending on the question, they may not have that. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, the, the customer care area, um, and last week when I got those calls, um, we may have, uh, there may have been some miscommunications with the folks that answered the phone. Um, I was told that um, by one person that the person that answered did not tell them exactly whether Notice went out, advisory went out or not. And so that was some frustration. But um, I think um, I, I would suggest that we kind of look at uh, some other way of communicating with folks. Um, usually they go out around 12, noonday television, 7 o'clock television. But most of these folks that uh, are calling me did not, they don't watch television yes, at a set period of time. So that's a gap, I think, in our notification um, regimen that we might want to take a look at. Um, and in this case, there were two neighborhoods impacted because of that one break. So... Um, I know that we've got within our network a, a number of uh, people who communicate within the neighborhood. The neighborhood presidents, folks like that, they kind of rely on, uh, they can touch folks individually better than we can. Um, I would hope that we might be able to make that part of our I think that would help. Um, none of them, what they were saying was, I believe you kind of gave an explanation as to what happened, but they did not hear anything. Uh, and some of them were relying on a notification to go ahead and boil your water, to boil water in general. They didn't get that. So I don't know what the breakdown was okay. the, the other than what you had explained. Yes, sir. The Nixle was down, has been down, was uh, b during that time, Nixle was down for, I think it was for about a week, but the next day it did go back mm -hmm. up. Um, so that would have touched the social media. So folks who do have social media um, may and are signed up to get notifications from the City of Columbia would have received it. Uh, through the years, uh, we've tried to look for ways to improve, and I think we will continue to do that. We've talked about with the AMI project having this one central location to have, to be notified um, for the water bill to be able to look up your water bill, you know, look at your meter reading, things like that, to be able to tie this notification to that, um, and that most customers will take advantage of, of an app or something that they can carry around with them, but so they will get that instant notification. 
Um, so <clears throat> through the years, um, we've looked at and we'll continue to look at, at better ways to notify and, and then maybe that we can get these um, community presidents, um, homeowner association presidents, maybe have a separate email for them. Um, that means they'll get every one of them, um, but but it, it may it may help provide notifications to the yeah, community. In this case, the, that that one pocket, Sandus Acres, basically elderly folks. Yes, sir. And so they, that is a challenge. But they have their grapevine. Um, they were communicating amongst themselves. No water. Uh, why didn't we get a notice? Uh, when the water is still brown. And the last one I got indicated that the water came back to them about ten o'clock. And I, I know that varies ba based on the, what do you call it, um, startup. It, it, based on the time it takes to fix it, and yeah. then it, 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 we slowly restore pressure, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm thinking that in an area like that, um, um, if, if somehow key people are notified, whether it's, it's got to be a list. I don't know. That's just a little gap in there that could um, that would help us out. Okay. I think, um, Council Bezier, a really good point about uh, you know we we should make sure we can do a little hand holding with the neighborhood association uh, presidents or leaders, having uh, making sure they get signed up for these services because then they would get everything yeah. that they yeah. send that would allow the grapevine to work. But people are consuming the news differently now and everybody's <laughs> looking to their cell phone and this this citizens app that we're looking we're in the process of developing mm -hmm. uh, trying to be a smarter city we can get a push notification to that phone and get more water drive it it also scrolls across our website too so i hear you about making sure we're closing the circle on customer care folks making sure mm -hmm. that they know they're getting the email that we're, we're talking to those folks and we're I think we did a good job. If we could, yeah, we could continue to accentuate uh, an element of education, particularly for our communities. Uh, there are water issues, and Joy and I talked about one earlier today. Yes, sir. Um, where there is an issue, they want to talk about it, but they only talk about it within themselves. And I think if we continue the process of educating, re-educating, whether it's through an app or however we do it, I think that's going to be to our advantage. Yes, sir. We don't know it. We just can't tell you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, just two quick. Um, one, yes, for the Everbridge, it says you can choose what type of alerts. What other alerts does Everbridge do? Miss Gathers got here just the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And then while Kim is coming up, um, just since you mentioned it, yes, where are we on AMR, ARF? We have completed our RFQ. We have six submittals for the RFQ. That basically means they're qualified to submit a proposal. Um, we're preparing the proposal right now. Uh, we're going through the last checks with our consultant, and uh, um, we're ready to get it on the road. So it's, it's. I, I'd love to say next week, um, but I'd, I'd have to. Verify that procurement. But that, that proposal is going to be the pricing proposal. So we've got to get that in there first. So we'll get all these through that. I'm anticipating June, July time. June, July is what we're anticipating. Okay. And then you guys get those recommendations. Once we approve a contract, when do you think you'll start seeing them switching out meters? It, it, once we approve the contract, it'll be about six months before we start seeing any meters really go in the ground. Operating and then network first, communication network. That's right. Am I? Uh, are we going to be engaging these local plumbers, like we said? We got a bunch of local plumbers going to yes, work. That's when part of the proposal. Start? Well, we'll be bringing the contract to you folks in July timeframe, and um, then the communication network is the first piece of work that happens when the meter change out you know, following the contract negotiation process. What? What? Uh, on the, the vendor that's selected. Okay. Again, so, does it? No, sir. Okay. It can't happen quick enough. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, yeah, man. Man. I could use a hundred of those. Very excited. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Kim, um, what other alerts do we get? Oh, yes, Ms. Devine. The um, Everbridge alerts, the emergency side of it would be for public safety, of course, and also public health and public safety, and, of course, water boils would be included in that, and uh, we are able to use the uh, emergency database for that, which would be all of the landline numbers in Richland County. Um, other alerts or notifications would be um, community events, um, public relations, um, any um, special events that um, any department would want to send out. And that would only go to those that have opted in and signed up for those type of notifications. So, well, if I go to msc.net 911 citizen alert today and I want to click on what alert does it allow me? Is it just a well, water right now and those are coming or are all those up there for me to opt into alert? All of them are there. Okay. Now the uh, public safety and, and the water boils would not be optional. You know, if it's an emergency situation, it would automatically be sent out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Duval. Joey. Yes, sir. While we got you. Yes, sir. I noticed there are several contracts on the tonight's consent agenda to fix broken order. Yes, sir. Is that going to clean up the backlog? Where are we on the uh, uh, list? Uh, we we're not through the list yet. I know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I can give you. We, we've had, since January, uh, we've had over 400. Just, I, will, I will tell you that. And I, I can't give you an, an exact account where we are in the list right now, but we, we are going through the list. Uh, we've had what's on the contract tonight is we've had to recruit local contractors to help us. Uh, we quickly ran through our, our budget this year just in that time frame uh, with our local contractors. Uh, we had mostly they were helping us with um, the restoration, but the ones on the agenda tonight are actually, we had some actually do some, some pipe repair as right. well. So We have enough complaints. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we I, have, I get the calls complaints about those plates. They, they don't yes, know sir. where those plates are, Sam. They leave them out there until they need <laughs> one, and they send a truck out. Go find us an 8 by yeah. 10 plate. Uh, yeah, I, you explained it to them, but um, I, I think... Uh, at least we cover them. We don't yes, sir. have the big holes, and then you get the calls about the front end being knocked out of the way. Yeah, oh, yeah. The folks that want us to pay for that all the time. I yes, want them to put an RFID identifier on each one of those plates so we'll know in real time where they are. Yeah. What, um, I, you know, I know one thing that, that works well for those who pay attention to it, when they put a plate down that they do the asphalt, on the end to kind of soften it. We um, actually, in our uh, our management meeting this morning, we talked about ways to not not even use an asphalt. What um, the rubber? Uh, what Plastic. they called the, the plate locks. Plate locks, yeah. Put it first time. You know that's one of the things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I tell folks that I've lost I'm two tires. I blew up two of them. But nobody in the city knows. Part of the progress. <laughs> <laughs> Got to watch how you say that. Yeah. Okay, but that's all right. That's well, if you have any questions tonight, we'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Next item is executive session. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, oh. I just want to add um, hospitality tax issue. To the to the to the uh, you, want, you want to get the read? Is that on there? No, I'm gonna add it. I'm gonna add it. Something I hadn't, I hadn't thought to you all about it. Before. Get some advice and counsel. Which one is it? Go one or under the legal advice. Uh, legal advice pertaining yeah. to potential claim. Potential claim or no, attorney client uh, privilege. Attorney client, seven. attorney client uh, privilege. Actually, you can go to seven or eight. Well, let's put it in seven. You want seven? Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion and we go into executive session for discussions and 
negotiations and instruments to propose contractual arrangements pursuant to 70A2, Bull Street Development, Lower Richmond Sewer Agreement, and Bond Council. Uh, to the discussion of negotiations and instruments to propose purchase of property pursuant to 70A2. Oop, that was not on there, it's been removed. And are both of them removed? Yes, Erica? they're both removed. Right. Both of them are removed? Yeah. Okay. Uh, receipt of legal advice relating to a pending, threatened, or potential claim, seven, uh, 70A2, I suppose. Um, Cato, as personal representative of the state of Richard Cato versus City of Columbia, Cumberland versus uh, City of Columbia. Receipt of legal advice which relates to a matter covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to 70A2, Boards and Commissions, H tax. Uh, discussion of matters related to proposed location of expansion of services to encourage location or expansion of industries or other businesses pursuant to 70A2, Affordable Housing Initiative. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? Seeing none, move the previous question. Clerk, call the roll. Here. Yes. Aye. 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 